Hello, my name is Mark Willis. The title of our presentation is The Calibration of Distributed Acoustic Sensing VSP Data. I'd like to acknowledge my co-authors that are listed here. They've made it possible to build the hardware and software systems used to acquire this data and then to interpret it. The outline of the presentation is given here. First, I'll give a motivation for conducting this study. Then I'll mention the hardware we use to collect the VSP data. This will be followed by a description of acquiring the field dataset. Finally, I'll show the match between the Geophone and DAS VSP datasets that demonstrate the validity of the DAS VSP data. There are many wells with existing fiber optic cables installed. In addition, every day there are more and more new fiber optic cables being installed. Both of these facts provide an opportunity to easily collect and analyze DAS VSP data. However, there's very little in the literature where DAS VSP data is quantitatively calibrated. In this paper, we'll attempt to dispel any doubts you may have about the fidelity of DAS VSP datasets. We have performed both laboratory and field tests, but since there's not enough time to describe our laboratory tests, we'll present only field data in this talk. We've used both P-Wave and shear wave sources, and I'll present our calibration results. This is a simplified schematic of a DAS VSP interrogator system. The dotted black box in the schematic outlines the DAS interrogator unit. The red line represents the fiber optic cable, which reaches from the interrogator unit to the bottom of the well. The laser fires a pulse of light into the fiber. The light passes through a circulator, which can be thought of as a switch. Before the light leaves the box, it encounters three fiber stretchers. These fiber stretchers allow us to encode the GPS timestamp, the zero time break signal, and the pilot sweep all directly into the recorded DAS VSP data. This makes it easy to keep track of the acquisition details. The light then emerges from the interrogator unit and travels along the fiber down the well. Impurities in the glass fiber backscatter light all along the fiber, which is then propagating back up toward the fiber, up along the fiber, toward the interrogator unit. These Backscattered signals are actually the ability for the fiber to record and sense seismic energy. So the backscattered light encounters the circulator, which directs the light to the receiver where it's converted into an electrical signal and ultimately digitized and converted into a seismic signal. This diagram shows the acquisition geometry for the field data I'll be showing. The red line indicates the well trajectory. The vertical section of the well extends to a depth of about 3,000 meters. The lateral section of the well is another 1,500 meters long. The fiber optic cable, shown in blue, runs the entire extent of the well and is cemented outside the casing. We collected geophone data in the vertical section of the well, shown by the green triangles. The channel spacing of the DAS data is one meter while the geophone sensors are about every 15 meters. We use both P-Wave and shear wave vibrators. We acquired three source offsets, a nominal zero offset at 116 meters, a mid offset at 750 meters, and a far offset at 1500 meters. First, we compare the vertical component geophone and the DAS VSP records using the P-Wave vibrator. This figure shows the zero offset P-Wave record for the geophone in the left panel and the DAS record in the right panel. The geophone record is from six sweeps and the DAS record used eight sweeps. We have excellent similarity. One rather interesting difference though is that there are more two waves on the geophone record than on the DAS record. And generally speaking, we try to get rid of those tube waves. So this is actually a benefit of DAS. This figure shows the corresponding responses for the mid offset P wave source in the vertical section of the well. Again, we see an excellent agreement. 
This figure shows the responses for the far offset P wave source. We see another excellent match. However, the theoretical response of the fiber is cosine squared theta, while the geophone is cosine theta. This is most apparent at shallow depths where the angle of incidence of the fiber of the seismic energy is almost 90 degrees to the fiber. Next, in the vertical section of the well, we compare the response of the vertical component geophone record to the DAS record using the shear wave source. This figure shows the records for the zero offset source. In theory, there should be no response to shear waves at zero offset. However, the source is actually located about 116 meters away from the wellhead to reduce the amount of tube waves generated. Here we see the source side lobe generated P wave energy. Here we see the shear wave energy. And as before, we observe the tube wave energy on the geophone data and not on the DAS data. This figure shows the record for a shear wave source at the mid offset location. We observe some P wave energy, but the red arrows show the prominent shear wave arrivals. Finally, this slide shows the records for the shear source at the far offset location. From these last three figures, it's clear that shear wave energy is indeed being recorded on the DAS records. Sudish Baku showed in his 2014 PhD thesis at MIT that the theoretical angular response of the DAS fiber to shear waves is more like a four-leaf clover. So this is the first field data set we've seen where we can compare the DAS shear wave response to geophones. Now in this figure, we show the DAS response for the complete well, including both the vertical and horizontal sections of the well. The left panel shows the P wave response for the zero offset source. And the right panel shows the shear wave response. Note that the vertical axis time scales are not the same. The area circled by the red oval denotes the heel of the well. At this location, the seismic energy is hitting the fiber orthogonally to the direction of the fiber cable. From theory, we know that the fiber response in this direction to both P wave and shear waves is null. So we see a drop in the amplitude of the first break at this location. This figure shows the same result now for the mid offset location. As before, we see a drop in the first break amplitudes when the source is located directly above that portion of the horizontal fiber. Finally, this figure shows the same results for the far offset source location. Again, the drop in the first break amplitudes is now at the toe of the well where the source is located. To directly compare the DAS and geophone traces, we alternatively block interleave 100 meters of traces from each data set. We are showing data from the mid offset source using the P wave vibe. We start with 13 geophone traces and then 100 traces of DAS data, and then we go back to 13 geophone traces, and so forth. On the left panel, the DAS and geophone data have the same polarity. We see that the downgoing events are all aligned and coherent with the same polarity, but the reflections have the opposite polarity. On the right panel, we reverse the polarity of the DAS data, and now we see that the upgoing, or reflections, events are aligned and clear on the display. Thus, we show that the reflection, reflected energy from the DAS signal has the opposite polarity from the geophone data. This is in agreement with previous observations, for example, by Shell and others in previous papers. Next, we compare slowness values from DAS, geophone, and sonic data sets. The red curve shows the sonic log, which has been upscaled to 15.4 meter interval. The blue curve shows the derived slowness values from the geophone data. The geophone slownesses are slightly larger, but show the same trends as the sonic log. And the black curve shows the slowness derived from the DAS data set. We see it matches both sonic and geophone data extremely well. Now let's look at one of the conventional VSP products, the corridor stack. The left side of traces, the left set of traces, is the corridor stack derived from the zero offset DAS VSP data. 
and the right column shows the corresponding corridor stack from the geophone data. As you can see, we have an excellent agreement between them. On the right plot, we now overplot the geophone data in black on top of the DAS data in blue, and we see very good similarity. So to further analyze this comparison, we've cross-plotted the normalized amplitudes from the DAS data on the horizontal axis with the geophone data on the vertical axis. The colors indicate the number of hits or folds in each cell for that figure. The dark blue indicates no hits, and the dark red indicates a maximum number of hits. And just for ease, I've plotted a 45 degree line, which represents a perfect match. And we can see that the DAS and geophone amplitudes match very well. So to further test the linearity of the DAS signal response, we acquired data from four different levels of source effort, a single vibe, two vibes, three vibes, and four vibes. Here we show the DAS data, but we also collected similar geophone data over a portion of the well. We then analyzed the first break amplitudes over this matching portion of the well as a function of source effort. The red circles define the region where we extracted the amplitudes of the first breaks. This inset plot shows the first breaks for a single vibe in blue, for two vibes in red, for three vibes in yellow, and four vibes in purple. The increase in amplitude is clear from the display. So here I've repeated the figure with the DAS first break waveforms in the right panel. And in the left panel, the blue X's in the graph show the average RMS amplitude of the DAS first breaks on the vertical axis as a function of source effort on the horizontal axis. We've normalized all the amplitudes by the value of the single vibe case. And the red line shows the best fit through the points. And we see that it's almost perfectly linear with a slope of nearly one. Now the right panel shows the amplitudes of the geophone data. The corresponding blue X's on the graph show the RMS amplitude of the geophone first breaks as a function of the source effort. As expected, the geophone data show a linear response also. We've made many other comparisons like this one using the entire waveforms. And in all cases, the response of the DAS waveforms show a clear linear response comparable to the geophone data. So next we look at the amplitude of the DAS data as a function of depth. This plot shows the RMS amplitude of the first breaks on the vertical axis as a function of depth on the horizontal axis. The red line is the geophone data and the black line is the DAS data. After we correct for spherical spreading, we obtain an average Q value of 88 for the geophone data and an 86 for the DAS data. So from these tests, we learned that we can trust the amplitudes of the DAS data from the top of the well all the way to the bottom of the well. The final test in this presentation will show the angular response of the fiber to P waves. This cartoon shows a really simplified diagram of the vertical and horizontal portions of the well. Shown at the top are the three shot locations, the zero offset in green, the mid offset in blue, and the far offset in gray. For each of these shot locations, we can determine an approximate incident angle to the fiber for the seismic energy, as shown by the color-coded numbers. Albena Mativa et al. in 2012 showed that the angular response of the fiber behaves like cosine squared. Here we plot the RMS amplitudes of the first breaks from all the shot locations and from both the vertical and horizontal sections of the well, which is color-coded and shown in the legend. Note how the data clearly fits the cosine squared function in black rather than the cosine theta, which is in red. In contrast, geophone data would follow the cosine theta response. We conclude with the following points. We've shown an excellent correspondence of DAS to geophone data. We confirmed that the DAS data on the DAS data, the reflections are opposite polarity from the geophone data. We've shown very good slowness matches with the log and geophone data. The corridor stacks match in amplitude. And we've shown the linearity of the DAS signal using different levels of source effort. We've also shown that we can trust the overall amplitudes of the DAS data from the top 
to the bottom of the well, given that we have a high quality fiber cable installation. And finally, we've confirmed the cosine squared response of the fiber to the angle of incidence of the P-wave seismic energy. Great strides in DAS data quality continue to be made every day, but even now the DAS BSP datasets can be acquired, processed, and interpreted with confidence. We'd like to thank the operator for allowing us to acquire and show the field datasets in this presentation. We'd also like to thank our other team members for their contributions to the study and Halliburton for allowing us to give this presentation. And most importantly, we thank you for viewing this presentation and hope that you found it useful.